in the in the frameworks. We have the test framework itself, which is the the supporting structure for writing your test classes. Um, contains the asserts that you use for testing your results. Um, there are a number of them available. MS Test is built into Visual Studio. <clears throat> so that's kind of why we'll be looking at that one today. Um, there are also a lot of plugins that work with MS Test. So uh, NUnit, um, XUnit, right, there are a whole list of them that are available. Um, but these are all APIs that you can write your testing code against. Then the second part of it is the execution, and that's the test runner. And again, MS Test has that. Um, ReSharper has a, a test runner. Uh, NUnit has a test runner. Again, a lot of companies, a lot of open source test runners are available. Um, and they will work with pretty much interchangeably with any of the testing frameworks. And then the third piece that's available is for mocking. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, but um, there are various frameworks for the mocking that help you isolate your code. Uh, so for example, you're not going to have to worry about, is my data layer ready to go so I can test my business layer? By using mocking, you can say, okay, I know I'm going to have this object with this shape. I don't care if the database is written. I don't care if the, the data access is written. I'm going to fake out my business object. And you can use any of these tools to do that as well. Uh, we'll be looking at mock um, as one of our demos a little bit later. <clears throat> OK, as far as the way you can implement tests, there are several different techniques or patterns. Um, one of the ones we're going to look at is just a simple test. You know, I'm going to set a property. Did it set to what I thought it was going to? Um, there are also things they call fakes, which this is kind of related to mocking, where I don't, anytime you're writing a test, you want to isolate that test as much as possible, because I don't want to test the whole application. I'm trying to test one piece of code. So by using fakes, by stubbing out the accesses to other pieces, you isolate that code and you say, OK, this is the only thing I'm worried about. I don't care if this other piece works or not. I'm testing this piece. Um, the stubs are something that you would use for your internal code where you have access to the code itself. Um, you'd be using this against, stubs only will work um, on interfaces. So basically, you would implement the interface as a dummy object. Um, shims are a similar concept, but you're using those for, against DLLs, so like the .NET frameworks or a third party assembly of some sort that you you can't change the code, but you need to be able to access it in some way, shape, or form. <clears throat> and then the last piece is mocks. And mocks pretty much replace the need for the fakes because mocks will do the same kind of thing. And by using the frameworks, they're much simpler to write. Um, when you're doing the fakes, you have to do a lot of wiring yourself. Uh, mocks will do a lot of that for you. OK, so when you're setting up your tests, the pieces that go into that, you'd have a test project. And that's a specific kind of project in Visual Studio. And they recommend that you set up a test project for each project in your solution. This is more for an organizational pattern than anything. So you can, once you've written your test, you know, OK, these tests correspond to this code. You don't have to guess about where things are, le are at. Um, same thing with the classes and the methods within your test. You would want to have, for each class that you want to test, you would want to have a test class. For each method that you want to test, you want to have a test method. You probably will end up with multiple test methods because of the happy paths and unhappy paths. Um, each test class has an attribute at the top of it. It says, hey, I'm a test class. That's how it knows that when you're ready to build your solution, don't include these. But when you're running your tests, these are the only ones that will be run, or the ones that have that test class attribute. <clears throat> and the same thing with the methods. There's a test method attribute that says, this is a method that you need to run with your test. Um, the reason they have that attribute within a test class is that you can also have private classes to perhaps set up data that you need set up. Um, 
within your test class. You don't want that to run as a test that's going to be used by your test. So you have this test method attribute that kind of separates it out. <coughs> okay, so when you're writing your test, a few things you want to keep in mind is you want to test one thing and one thing only. You don't want to test half a dozen pieces of code because if one thing in there breaks somewhere, now you've got to debug the whole thing. If you test one entity, one method, one property, one, one small piece of self-contained code, you know if it fails, this is where I need to go look. So each unit test is self-contained. <clears throat> Probably want to do one unit test for each use case. So when you have your requirements, you're going to see, you know, like, okay, if this happens, then we want to do this. If this happens, we want to do this. Those kinds of things would probably indicate that you need to have a separate unit test. You always want to test for unhappy paths as well as happy paths. Um, one of the places that I used to work, I did code reviews, and I had one, devel one developer that always did the happy path and was always upset with me because the first thing I would do when I would pull up his code, I'd run it and I'd hit save. No data, nothing entered, hit save, blows up back to him. So always watch your unhappy paths, too, because that's where your users are going to hit things. Um, some of your best testers, that's the first thing they'll do. Um, I've, through the course of my career, I've worked with a few people It's like, oh, I want you to test my code all the time, because they will always go straight to the place that's going to break. I don't know how they did it. It was just, I guess, a knack. <clears throat> and the last thing to keep in mind on your tests is you want to write long descriptive names. And you'll see when we get into to the demo, when you run your test, there's a, uh, basically a list of your tests that shows up. <clears throat> and it'll tell you as you're running your test, OK, this one succeeded, this one succeeded, this one failed. If you have nice long descriptive names, you're not going to have to go digging through and saying, OK, well, what was I doing with that test? Um, so the more descriptive you are with your test name, the easier it's going to be for you to debug as you get into it. Yes. What was the name of the book again? Uh, Pragmatic Unit Testing in Future. That sounds like an excellent book. I'll have to check that out. <clears throat> OK. When you're writing a unit test, this is we're talking about an individual test here. There's a basic pattern that you want to flow through. Um, the first piece is a range. And what a range is referring to is setting up your variables. So if, you have a, if you're testing a method that requires some input variables, you'd want to set those up here. You also want to set up your result fields so you have something to compare against when you run your test. So if I were setting a property, I would say, OK, input property name equals and set my value, and then expected result field name and my expected value. So that way you've got everything set up at the top. You've got an idea tied back to this particular method of what you want to, to test in here. The next piece, pretty obvious, is act. This is when you actually execute the code. So I've set up my input variables. I'm going to call my method, get my results back. <clears throat> and then the last piece is assert. And the assert is where you actually check the results coming back. Um, they're called asserts because that's what the classes are called in the, that MS unit test framework that we talked about earlier. And that's where you do things like assert is equal. And then you give your variables. So it's going to do all of your testing for you. You don't have to sit there and say, if this field is equal to this field, it's good, otherwise fail. These assert tests will do that. And they've got several categories of these assert tests. They've got their single value tests, which are just the assert dot is equal, is not equal, is true. Um, you've got collection tests, so you can compare a collection in and out to make sure your data is working OK. 
um, string asserts, which will allow you to test strings for content. And then there's also an expected exception attribute. So if your code has some place in it that says, hey, if this thing happens, throw an error, you can catch that expected exception and make sure that you're getting back the error you expect to get. Anybody got any questions or comments so far? OK. Go show you some code. This is going to be fun because I can't see this over here. Can you make it bigger? Yeah. Right after I find my mouse on this thing again. Screen there. Tell me. Yeah. Another point. Or projector. Okay, so this is a um, just a little demo that I found online. Um, it's a real simple little class. Um, we're going to do some bank account type of work. So we've got this class that we're going to set up with just a customer name and a balance. And we've got our properties. And then we've got a couple of methods. So we have this one called debit. It sounds pretty obvious. We're going to send in an amount. And we're going to subtract it. And we've got a credit. OK, this one, we're going to do a little bit of testing around before we do any kind of crediting. And then we've also got a couple properties down here. So the way you would go in here and set up your test is you come in and you say, oh, this is going to be a pain. Um, I want to add a new project. And it's going to be a unit test project. And I'm going to call this. bank tests. OK, so you'll notice that the first thing, we got a basic structure here. We've got a using statement. This is the one that actually contains all of our cert statements and all of the code that we need to write co the test-specific code. Um, since this doesn't mean a whole lot here, we're going to rename this. And we're going to call this bank account tests. And I didn't get the tape. Oh, well. OK, so you see here we've got our test class. You probably can't see because it's too small. Uh, we've got the test class attribute. And we've also got <coughs> our unit test method attribute. Um, another thing to be very aware of is that all of your test classes need to be public. And all of your test methods need to be self-contained. You do not return any value from a test method. So the first thing I need to do is make this test project aware of what I'm testing. So bank tests. And then since you don't want to sit here and watch me type all day, where is my mouse? There we go. I'm sorry. Thank you. OK, Dan, what I said about the nerves, they're not gone. It doesn't help that I'm having trouble seeing the screen. So, oh, come on. 
There we go. Okay, come on. It was called bank, right? You know. There we go. So for our first test, we want to test that we're getting some valid amounts. So we're going to validate that we can update the balances, and we're going to do the debit. So here we were talking about, let's get this one down. So we were talking about setting up, arranging our data. So here we're going to set up a beginning balance, what we're going to subtract from it, what we expect, and then set up our actual, our actual account. So that's pretty straightforward, basic C-sharp code. Okay, then we do our act, which means we're going to go in and we're going to say, execute the debit method, and here's my amount. And then this is the, act, this is the assert part, so we're going to check to see what we've got coming back. So since we're dealing with an object here, we need to actually get a single property, so we're going to set up this actual. And what this R equal is, is we're going to say if this is equal to this within this range. It does give you the ability to have some rounding going on. So, And if it fails, we're going to get this result back. So to run our tests, Okay, and the first thing we see is that our test failed. If you want to find out why your test failed, you can hi highlight that one and then it will come to the bottom here. Come on. And it's not going to let me make that one bigger. Okay, so this one's saying that it expected a difference that was no greater than this, but we actually did not get the same amount. Our actual coming back, we expected 744 and we got back 1654. So it sounds like we've got something a little hokey here. So if we come over and look at our method, and you'll see also in the method it fit, failed. We come down here. Oh, well, we didn't debit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've got unit testing. You're not going to get any advantage out of it. <laughs> okay, and now since we've got this test explorer set up, I can just come over here and hit, and now we pass. Okay, any questions? God, I do such an awesome job. <laughs> okay, one of the other things we wanted to test was these out-of-range exceptions that we've got here. So notice we've got those on both the debit and on the credit. Um, so we want to set up some tests for doing those. Too far down, did I? Okay, so that's the one we ran already. 
Okay, so this, in this one, we're going to test to see if we're getting our out of range exception. So again, we do our range. And the test here is that when the amount is less than zero, should throw an argument out of range. Okay, this is where your descriptive names come into play. So the more descriptive your test method name is, the easier it's going to be for you to figure out what in the world's going on. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with the same kind of beginning balance, and we're going to debit $100. Okay, and we should get an exception on this. So when we do our debit amount. We should throw this exception. Now, on the test method for this particular case, notice we don't have the assert. We're handling the assert with an attribute. <coughs> and this is another way you can do set up your unit testing for, the, for this type of error. So we're going to expect to see this argument out of range exception. So if we come over here and we say run all, again we will build. And we threw the exception that we expected to see. If he doesn't do that, does he just say expected exception in the text or not received? Yeah, in that case, it would have failed. Yeah. It gives you a good best method. Mm -hmm. yeah, the yeah. Mm -hmm. I expected this. You either did nothing or you returned a different Or you returned a different exception. Or you changed that to a positive 100. That's what it would have failed, right? You didn't get the budget. Yeah. But here I'm expecting it to fail and it didn't fail, so now it should fail with all the different errors. And it's going to make a liar out of me. Is that the same exception if you're debiting more than the error? Uh yes. Is that the same error? Yes. exceptions on top it's supposed to fail. Sure. And it used to. I know any unit fails in that case. Hmm. Well that sucks. <laughs> okay. So I guess what this is saying is we've got a bad test. Yeah. Good catch Al. <laughs> um let's see. That should have. Let's go look at our code. And when I did the ten dollars, it was a negative ten, wasn't it? Uh -huh. Both of those codes fail. Yeah. Yeah. So if you did plus twelve. You there you go. Okay, so it's saying that it should have thrown an out of range exception and it did not. So that was a failing test. One thing that I think is helpful too is you can put a breakpoint in your test step through the code and then Good point. figure out what, what's going on. You can break both in the test and then the mm -hmm. Yeah, because one of the options you have is um, debug next and down. Yes, thank you. Debug all tests. And at this point now we can just debug just like you would any other C sharp code. I can see uh, paying attention to the test in the case because in, in effect you're testing for failure and it failed so you passed the test. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. a double negative test. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the concept with TDD that I'm still having a hard time wrapping my head around. Mm -hmm. When you do TDD, which is the test first, you want to write your test so it fails. Then you write your code to the point that your test now passes. And I just Red, green, refactor. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I hate 
And I, I've always had a problem wrapping my head around that one. I keep so having people. Right to shed and right to shed. <laughs> it, it, it's hard to wrap your head around, but um, I think you should start off doing it like this, write the code first and then the test, and then when you get good at it, then you can start to think about doing the test first. Like for side load, the algorithm was so complicated, um, we actually had thousands of unit tests, and um, me personally, I would like to write just a little bit of it, and then I would write the rest of the test, and then test the algorithm by test, by you know, write the algorithm by the test. I'm not full TDD, but but inching towards it. Mm -hmm. What um, options do you have for testing projects? <laughs> Yeah, it, so wants most people it wants don't test public. the privates. Most people only are testing the publics, and th there's a way to do it. I, I can't remember how to do it, but it has to be internal. It can't be private. You have to do internals and this is divisible too. You put a custom attribute in the assembly info at the assembly level. You say internals visible too, and you give it the assembly name. And then at that point, the compiler says, "I know this is technically not supposed to be available to me, but if you told me it is, I'm going to hack the compiler to allow you to get access to that method." Yes, if it's private, private, private is, is in theory supposed to be uh, supporting something else, and it's supposed to be private implementation of that. But you can get an inherent situation. How technically, you shouldn't test something as a side effect of testing something else, and that private is being tested as a side effect of testing something else. Mm -hmm. Your levels away from that method are farther away. <coughs> I think you're best to test your publics and make sure you have coverage. So make sure your private's all getting hit and you've got full coverage in the code. stuff where you set up a class, you make everything protected. You know, it's a totally different way of doing things. So when you're protected, they're technically private mm -hmm. through that class. And mm -hmm. then you can inherit and create a mock class to inherit from that and then expose everything publicly through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but some people, you know, there's a different level of problem with making everything protected when it's really supposed to be private. Because then you're like, oh, hey, I'm just going to inherit this class and just and mm -hmm. hijack it. And then, you got, you know, then you got other problems. You got other problems, like, Um, I keep moving this mouse in the wrong direction to get over to my screen. <laughs> okay, so one of the things that you notice is that we've got this test. I guess I should have shown you the whole, both of these tests. Come on. Um, that we're throwing the same method. Um, <coughs> Did I get the other? Yes. Okay, so both the debit and the credit are throwing the same type of error. So it really doesn't give us a good indicator of where that error is coming from. So you can also, in addition to doing these argument um, or these exception catching, you can also use um, a string test. So what we're going to do is come over here and set up a little bit more detail on these methods. So the first thing I'm going to do is set up some, just some strings that I'm going to check that I'm going to use for my errors. And then I'm going to modify my methods down here to use those errors. And I've 
forgot to get that piece. Okay. So here, instead of just throwing the out of range exception, I want to give it a little more information. Okay, so now I'm going to throw a slightly different error with a message available to me. And I want to test for that in my test method. So I'm going to modify my test method a little bit here as well. Do that again. <coughs> Just being control stubborn. A, D. That's what I was trying to do, and it's not doing anything. Oh, I've got an error down here. Cutting and pasting is not always a good idea. <laughs> there, that's better. I'm an old-time VB programmer converting to C-sharp, so I'm still kind of learning these things. I've gotten used to typing the curly braces and the semicolons, but some of it still gets a little confusing. OK, so now what we've got is we're going to test what comes back in that exception. So we've put this in a try catch. Where's my okay. So if you see here, instead of having just doing our act, we're actually going to do a try catch. And we're kind of combining, we're kind of violating the pattern a little bit because we don't have those totally separate, but we still are doing an assert separately. The other thing we need to do, oh this one's already okay. This is a different test. Okay, notice on this case, since we're doing a try catch, we don't want to catch that exception separately. So we're going to have not have the attribute at the top. We're going to just catch it down here. And this was one of those string assert methods that I was telling you about. What it'll do is it'll, it'll actually look at that message coming back from the exception and say, what, what's in here? Do I have the <coughs> value that I expect? So we can come over here now. Where did my mouse go? There we are. And run them all again. And everything passes. Okay, which means we actually caught this error with this message. Okay, so that's two ways you can handle your exception messages coming out. Anybody got any questions? Anything? You haven't thrown a thing at me yet, Chris. <laughs> OK, well, the other thing I wanted to do was show you a little bit of what mocking looks like. Uh, I'm not going to go into as much detail on this one, but I did want to show you how mocking looks in the <coughs> application. I keep losing my mouse. There we go. Okay, so there are a few things you need to do a little bit differently when you're using mocking. Um, the first thing you have to do is get the mock DLL. Um, so before this, I went and downloaded it. Uh, mock, I've got a reference uh, slides at the end of this that have resources. There's a reference in there to the link to um, find the mocking framework. Um, so you download that, unzip it, put it someplace where you can get to it, add the reference, and then 
as you're using. Mocking is actually Google. So they, they talk together. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> um, there are a bunch of mocking frameworks out there available. Um, I mainly grabbed this one because we've used that here in the past in other source, projects. Is it? It's it is open, open source, source, yes. Um, There's no mocking support native for use. I don't, and don't and yeah, the, the fakes, and, and yeah. And that's what this is avoiding, so is, so yeah. This, this will. <laughs> okay, and then in the same as we did before, we have to get our methods, our using and uh, references over here. And this particular class, this particular project has a, a call out to a, a feed to do a calculation. Um, this particular one is actually going out to do um, a translation of a, do a con currency conversion. These things actually have names, who knew? Um, and this is one of those cases where we don't want to go out and test, you know, is that service available? That's not what we're trying to test here. We're trying to test the code we're writing. So what we want to do is to be able to mock out that feed. So by using the mocking code, we can come in here and set up basically this private here, a private mocked method. And this is similar to the way we did our arrange, but this time we're looking at a method instead of going through a class that we actually set up. So we're saying, telling it, I want to mock this class. Here's the interface to it. I want you to set it up so I'm going to return this value. And this, this setup is part of the mocking framework. This is the kind of thing that if you weren't using the mocking framework, you would have to write by hand. But by using the mocking framework, you, you skip all that process. You can just tell it, hey, mock, go set this thing up for me. Here's the object. Here's what I want to see coming back from it. And then return that object. So then your testing method will use that mocking object. So we've created it. We're going to say, go use this. Here's my feed do my calculations. And we can use that object throughout this test. So if we set a breakpoint here, and let's do one here. When we run this test, Oh, I didn't tell it to debug. <laughs> okay, so now when I come in here, I'm getting ready to do my test. Notice instead of going over to the regular object in my original class, I've come over here to my mocking class. And that's the object that I'm returning. So I have just isolated my test completely self-contained. And then we'll use that same object. <laughs> it's not supposed to do that. Sure, what, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's how the mocking works. And you see how complicated it was. <laughs> only mock interfaces with mock, right? You can't mock classes. Um, no, I think you can mock classes, mock classes. as well. I yeah. think that's one of the advantages of using the mocking framework. <laughs> if you don't use it, if you're doing the, the stubs or the shims, then stubs you can only use interfaces. But with a mocking framework, you can do objects as well. Yeah, we did it in um, Coke 
we wanted to check that um, we mocked the logger and we would check to make sure that a message was logged. So you could just check the method that, that it sent in something to, to log as we can. Okay, anybody got any questions on that? Just if it's static or can't. Okay. Now when I find my mouse again. Okay, so we did the mock, looked at the mocking. Any questions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it sounded yeah. interesting, didn't it? <laughs> ah, yeah, I can do that. The coverage is real easy to demo right after I find my mouse. Okay, so I've already run tests against this one. You can tell because I've got the pass test there. Come over here, analyze code coverage, all tests. And right there. And you can keep drilling down so you can see, okay, well I've got you know basically one third of coverage here. Well what did I cover? And you keep drilling down into it. Can you double click on and say which line has been covered or not covered, or is that only aware of that one. <laughs> yeah, that's the only way to visualize it. So, you know, the whole point is to use the visualization tool. Because this used to not be this way. The only end cover used to be this. <coughs> and uh, so you can tell on a sequence level which lines have not been covered. So then you go and you write more tests and you just keep going until the orange disappears, particular or whatever color you set up for. So what there's, what's this showing here is she never passed in frozen. So therefore, that, that area was never, was never tested. This also gets into the whole thing of psychomatic complexity, which is why you should never make your code such a convoluted amount that you can't test it because you would have to write, you know, an order of magnitude of tests just to get something done. But I don't think I don't think Visual Studio does psychomatic complexity. Okay. Doesn't it? It won't do psychomatic complexity or methods. Yeah, if you get psychomatic complex, that's a whole different conversation. But man, if you get above like 10, I mean, I've seen methods of like 600. <laughs> you know, you get those auto generated ones and you're, you're way up in the stratosphere. I think if it doesn't fit on the screen, it's too much. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger monitor. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you have a mixed line. So if you get an okay where you do an if else, like in our if this and this or this or that, I'm pretty sure that this will also show it where half the line was covered because you never hit the other uh, half of this check. Mm -hmm. And that forces you to keep writing more tests to get to the other half. So you can make sure that every single path, possible path, is mm -hmm. covered by the code. So you Siemens is, is huge on half coverage and branch coverage the right stuff that can kill you. Um, totally yeah. Okay. Yeah, something else that we did unit testing on that helped us a lot was um, we had to refactor an algorithm. We wrote something back in 2005 in AB.net and then we're upgrading it and adding new features and they wanted it in C sharp. So what we did in general like this could be PowerShell and um, we generated 
the unit test through PowerShell by looking at the database, this is what the results were. And so we actually generated 2,000 tests. <coughs> and then when we refactored into C Sharp, we at least knew at that point that the code did what it used to do. And, and then we started adding new features to it. And that could be very handy when you're doing any kind of upgrades from one release to the next of a framework or a tool or anything like that. Yeah, it became unruly to maintain all those tests if you add a new feature and you just broke a thousand <coughs> tests. But it, it's great to say that, hey, you, you just refactored it and then you're from the same set point that you're at. Mm -hmm. I also found it made us cocky because we'd write um, <laughs> all these unit <laughs> tests and um, then we'd say, well, we're absolutely positive there are no bugs. And then whenever they found a bug, we were just floored that there was a bug. <laughs> <laughs> and, and usually what it was was we didn't understand the problem. So it still doesn't fix that issue. If you don't understand the problem, your test will be wrong too. I'm glad you pointed out that That gets away from that then. Don't have to worry about the is true. Okay, I've got two slides of reference or resources here because I kept stumbling on things. <coughs> the internet is an awesome tool, but it can also be a two-edged sword. You keep finding more and more and more stuff out there. Um, these slides will be available, so you can go and check the links yourself to see what all good kind of stuff is out there. Um, that first. Uh, tutorial, our first demo that we did is this link right here. Uh, it's got the code out there, so you'll find that I didn't invent a thing here. I just swiped it. Um, but these first two here are very good um, introductory level unit testing in their MSDN. They've got all kinds of great source code in them. Um, this Simple Talk, this is actually the first of a series um, of discussions about doing TDD, which I thought was really good. Um, this list of open source tools was just kind of interesting because it's, um, it's just got a list of everything that's available to test any kind of technology you can write. So it's not just .NET, it's got all kinds of you know, non.NET testing tools, just a list of them, just to show you what's out there. Um, this Pluralsight course, I cannot recommend this course enough. This, it was just really a, a good way to come at the, the whole concept of writing unit tests. Um, and then these last two links are the mocking information. And that's it, guys. So, I've got a question. What the people are really doing this pretty, pretty much in depth? What conversion control containers or, or frameworks that you sell them on? <laughs> I work for a company that we were not allowed to write unit tests because they had another project that failed because they feel that they failed because they took too long writing unit tests. So we're not allowed to write unit tests anymore, ever. Mm -hmm. well, that's the kind of, that's the kind of experience I'm looking for. Because we've got that. Those but I think, Steve, you have to be smart about what are you building that's testable. Mm -hmm. And algorithm intensive things like what you guys do are really testable and really good to um, build that way. I did all my Connect stuff, and um, I said, hey, let me get some more experience with um, TDD, and I, it was a real big pain because with Connect you have all these coordinates, and just to, to do a test took forever, and then actually write the code was super fast. And what I found was the math intensive stuff, where I was computing vectors and lines and distances, 
that was perfect for TDD, where it was real easy to write a test and it didn't it didn't take long. That's a very small part of what we do. Yeah. The algorithm. Big So I mean, I like IOC. So if you want to go on the IOC path, I mean, I use IOC because that is my mock. I can use that. I can I can pass the uh, mock version of the of the interface into the unit tests that are different than the actual one that's actually being used in the actual application. I interface to everything now. Mm -hmm. People are like, there's a lot of interfaces. Yes, there's a lot of interfaces. And six months from now, you're going to appreciate the fact that this interface exists. Right. Yeah. 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 Anything with uh, interfacing or making a uh, laugh object? Or like context? Uh, I don't know much about laugh. It doesn't support some data types. So. <laughs> I wouldn't write many tests around laugh because you're usually trying to isolate, remove the dependency on the database for the uh, test. I disagree 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't want to test the generated code, no, but things that use that code, maybe like in transactions or things like that in business management, that's a class. Or if you've got me, you send something else and you're going to resolve that. Join, maybe. You what? You don't necessarily want to save that stuff. Wait, uh, you you during your test, you want to be hitting the database. You have to try to remove that dependency. Exactly. If you have triggers and you have logic and for procedures, unfortunately, you should really be testing the data. If you're just looking for uh, a quick result with a certain set of conditions that you said you're just going to try to pass to the database at all. Yeah, that, there's, two, there's two levels of detail here. There's lab, which that, that works with Yeah, that. you work yeah. with So there's lab, where you can you can test the things lab is supposed to do. And then here is the model that I'm supposed to persist. Mm -hmm. and I would expect the persistent code to look like this, mm -hmm. right? It's a basic level. You do just static analysis of the code. You can test databases independently of that, right? Right. I have a stored procedure. If I spool up this database, put the data in here, and run a stored procedure, this should pass on. Right. What you said. Yeah, we, we have a case in ours where when this particular field is passed in, a trigger gets fired because it has to determine whether or not it truly changed. And if it did, it has to go and set something else. And the business. The website is not the only source of that piece of data. Yeah. I, I have no idea. What I'm not a big fan of yeah. anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, well, Hal's not here, so we can have this debate later. But, uh, but no. <laughs> yeah. I, and th yeah. It gets complicated, but you just break it up in little tiny pieces. Right. Yeah. I saw that the the examples that you gave were behind the scenes, non-visual. Um, and maybe this is where one draws a line in terms of what I'm going to write you the test for and what I'm not. But uh, presumably you could do this for the UI related stuff as well. Yeah, um, and I did come across references and, and links to that very discussion. Um, there were some, I came across some for MVC testing for just ASP.NET, you know, straight website testing. So yeah, you can test the UI. Um, I didn't get into that for here. Um, WinForms, you can do the same thing. It seems to me that's a slippery slope because the UI is always changing and every test is going to be failing, failing, failing. And, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, it, it depends on what you're doing, right? Uh, you know, you can use Phantom. Are you trying to determine whether or not the UI screws itself out correctly? I don't know. I'm just, you know, uh, thinking big picture in terms of uh, we, we already use some of this for, the, for, for our algorithm testing, automated algorithm <coughs> testing, which we used to fall and I sat down for hours going to things manually. Mm -hmm. And then he automated them. Now we're looking at okay, well, how can we start expanding on this concept? <coughs> um, and we, you know, we, we outsource work to places, and they spend three x on unit testing. And in our space, because we're an FDA, FDA regulated device, we're prepared to bite the bullet. Um, but I can understand other places saying, oh, you know, you're spending four times on the project, and a third of that or two thirds of that is testing. Um, depends what you're doing. If you're, if you're mm -hmm. dosing insulin. You better be right. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Please. If you're, you know, and if you're, yeah, exactly. And if you're balancing people's bank accounts, you better be right. But if you're recommending, you know, curtain colors, who cares? Um, I think we can touch lines with Tom. He's got a lot by Sorry. But I can put a patch out. No, I know. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to tell me. Send no, me I the wrong know. shade. I don't die. May may get angry, but. <laughs> the problem is when you get into the, 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 the more complex the problem is, the bigger portion of the testing. Like you said, three to four X that you know, so I wrote a timing profiler 
and we had 34,000 unit tests for 1,100 lines of code, <laughs> right? So, uh, yeah, but you're rewriting IL. You rewrite IL incorrectly, and all of a sudden, really bad things happen. You know, like really bad things happen. Um, but yeah, I know. I mean, the problem with, with testing UI, I mean, Angular is supposed to solve some of these problems, but it's a whole different problem too. Is you know when you start doing jQuery and you start doing the Ajax framework, well, you've written all this JavaScript. You really can't test that because you know now you have jQuery. So unless you can abstract that out and use some type of IOC type of thing, or you have some kind of method that always does your Ajax stuff, you know, it's hard to just say, well, we have this this pile of stuff. Let's let's test it. Unless you architect it correctly up front, you, I, I would have to see samples of what you're doing to see what you know is it legitimate that they spent four times yeah. on the testing or if it's just I see some other tools for testing phone ends where it's more macro based. It's like, okay, I'm getting ready to, I want to create a test for four so Click here, click that, into this, you know, and everything you just did is now recorded. So mm -hmm. do it, oh, well, look, it brought up the browser, put in the URL, the width of the page, and click on the right field. Obviously, you have to update that if you move fields around and things like that. Um, but I mean, but that's all saved and stuff. So now you do the build, run the test. All of those are tested. But in his case, he might have to have a whole mock server where yeah. the server is in a particular state, the browser then goes against that server. I mean, you know, you got that's why you know when I do unit tests, I do project name dot test dot I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> I have a unit test project and I have an integration test project. Because unit tests should have no side effects, should not mm -hmm. be managing dependencies and once they have to start interacting with stuff like databases or file systems, you then have integration tests. Mm -hmm. You can test build to just run every single time you compile. You should in theory go run your test and not even notice they're running. It should run just absolutely blazing fast. And then the integration test maybe before you go check in, or you have to build a server that does the integration test. But you know, people are like, why do you have four thousand unit test projects? <laughs> really, <laughs> um, you have to look at the return on investment. And um, most of our clients were building an app and giving it to them, and they're supporting it. So. Most of the time, <coughs> we're already the highest bidder, and if if something is really complex, then it's easier to develop. I think using test driven development, but if it's not so complex, your first time, um, this is the first iteration of the project, and you're supporting it, it's less expensive to not build a whole bunch of unit tests on it. For you, you have no choice. I mean, when you have regulations, you have to have the unit tests, so and, and a product based is also something that we're supporting and, and it's a great case for TDD, I think. Do you actually have a website that has all these tests or is it a, a, a service? Um, it's an app we deploy at a customer site. Like a one form? So it's yes then? No, it's a, uh, well, it's got both. We get a, a client server component. We get a web website as well. It's all the same database. Same algorithm comes here by both. Obviously, we're, we're moving more and more and more towards having these test cases executed at uh, compile time, etc. All right. <laughs> Better than doing it by hand. It is. Mm -hmm. Awesome, Bill. Thank you. You're welcome.